Okay, so welcome to a UNCG online learning and innovation webinar series. This was started way pre-pandemic in times where um, we wanted to help people. And of course, it's now more important than ever to think through how we can help our students online. Um, but it can be about anything to do really with instructional tech. So a lot of the stuff we talk about um, can also, of course, be used in hybrid or in-person um, things as well. So here's the link to the webinars. We do record all the webinars. We're being recorded right now. Um, and we put them on YouTube, closed caption them through YouTube, and they're all available through that link. Um, so keep that in mind. You also, if you signed up, uh, get an email with the recording um, as well, as well as slide materials if the presenter wants to share them. So um, uh, keep that in mind. We This is our first one of the series, and this series has been taken over by a new group on campus called the Faculty Support Network, which kind of um, helps uh, coordinate all these um, professional development opportunities for faculty um, and staff and grad students um, and make sure we're not like duplicating efforts. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. It's, it's I'm their representative from the libraries, but this is put on by anyone who wants to um, present something on online learning or instructional tech. So our next one coming up, as you see, is by someone in ITS. Um, and Nora, I'm gonna drop the link to the chat again, if you can hear me. Um, this is, we're just going over logistics. We just got started with the recording. So um, I'm Sam Harlow, I'm the online learning librarian, and I'm here just for tech support, you know, so I push record, um, but if you have anything going on that happens, you're welcome to chat in and I'll manage the chat while Jenny is presenting. I'll also notify Jenny if there's a pressing question, you know, that needs to be addressed, so you don't have to worry about that. So we do ask that you stay muted if possible during the presentation and you can unmute at the end to ask questions. This is a 30 minute webinar. Um, we try to stick to it as close as possible, but if we uh, go a little over, remember it's being recorded um, and you can always email Jenny or I with questions. Um, so if there's no other little, I mean, I feel like we're all pretty used to Zoom now, but if you have any questions about Zoom, you can let me know in the chat. Um, and if not, I'll um, quickly introduce um, the um, our presenter Jenny. So um, Jenny is today going to be talking about. Let me read the title um, while y'all are filling out the Mentimeter. Anti-plagiarism instruction that works. Plagiarism and instruction. Um, I'm personally excited to hear about this as someone who teaches online um, and doesn't want to use Respondus Lockdown Browser or anything like that. So um, here we go. So Jenny, you can take it away. All right. Awesome. Thank y'all so much for being here today. Um, I'm not necessarily going to talk explicitly about just online teaching. Um, as Sam mentioned, a lot of these uh, concepts that I'm going to talk about can be applied hybrid, in-person, all kinds of things. But just so that you know, I have done the things that I'm going to be talking about today, I have done in online and hybrid course situations. Um, so again, that's why, that's why I'm hoping they will work for you. Okay, so I asked y'all um, I will introduce myself more fully in a minute, but I do want to pull up the results to this little Mentimeter survey. So I asked you, what brought you here today? Um, help my students and improve my teaching. Just wanted to learn more about anti-plagiarism instruction. I have a bunch of students who complete final reports and a lot of materials I feel aren't written in their own words. This is something I hear about a lot, believe it or not. Um, I love these learning series. I love that. Look at that. Such a such enthusiasm. And then I asked, how would you define plagiarism? Not everybody got to this one, but um, copying content and reposting it as your own. And that's a good sort of solid definition of plagiarism. Uh, typically, you know, we think of plagiarism as um, some sort of unethical use of sources, either using someone's words and passing them off as your own. Often at UNCG, it sort of ends up being not citing things correctly, not knowing how to paraphrase or summarize in an appropriate manner. So one of the reasons I asked this question is because most of us would probably define plagiarism like in the same ballpark, but not exactly the same way. Um, and that's something that I've come across in my research about this, that most instructors uh, kind of, you know, again, sort of the same area, but not exactly the same definition. So this is anti-plagiarism instruction that works, and I am Jenny Dale. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the information literacy coordinator at UNCG. Um, and one of the reasons that I was uh, excited to do this particular session this semester is that information literacy is a part of the MAC curriculum, the new Minerva's academic curriculum. And when we talk about plagiarism, 
or helping people avoid plagiarism, it connects really to all information literacy outcomes that are in the MAC program, which are split between the foundations courses and the health and wellness courses. And I think this might be particularly relevant for the health and wellness courses, which do require some source integration. Uh, you can also follow along with these slides or get back to them later um, at the link you'll see on the screen and that I just pasted in the Zoom chat. All right, so I wanna just give a very, very brief comment on the state of anti-plagiarism instruction. Um, and I have only a couple of quotes here. Um, the Association of College and Research Libraries, which is kind of our big academic libraries um, organization, national organization, we had a virtual conference uh, recently back in April, uh, and there was a great session there about plagiarism instruction or anti-plagiarism instruction. And I do have it linked within my slides so that you can actually see the video. But these are two folks who are actually, neither of, the, neither of them are currently academic librarians, but they both have been. Um, and one of the things that they talked about in their presentation uh, is just sort of the, the issues with anti-plagiarism instruction. And so I found this very compelling because it really matches up with the way that I've seen this kind of work being done. Um, they describe it as being compliance driven, taught in a one shot setting and typically decontextualized. And that reference to one shot is sort of library specific, but I'm gonna talk about how that, even the, the idea of sort of one and done plagiarism instruction can apply all, all throughout our different courses. So, the other argument that they make here is that our traditional anti-plagiarism measures are punitive, harmful, and widespread. Um, and so thinking about how we can kind of address these issues, when we think about, I doubt any of us get like really excited when we think about plagiarism instruction or anti-plagiarism instruction, and students don't either, believe it or not. Um, so one of the things that I think we can do to address these issues of this being sort of uh, the compliance driven is to really talk to students about the academic integrity policy. Don't just say, you need to read the policy, you need to sign this and say that you've read the policy. Um, talk to them about it. It is a very dense and kind of intense document and it can be really helpful to talk through it with them. And particularly if you engage students in a discussion, this, uh, this also connects to that, that idea that Hill and Tadeo shared about it being um, you know, decontextualized. We, we just talk about plagiarism in a way that first we assume students kind of understand what it is and what it means um, when we all know that we might all define it a little bit differently. But we also don't talk about the why. We say, don't do it. It's bad. You get in trouble. All those things are true. It is bad to plagiarize. You do get in trouble if you're caught plagiarizing. But we don't always talk to students about why it actually matters, why that's something that matters to you as an instructor, or why it matters to the university, why it's part of this larger sort of concept of academic integrity. The other thing I would recommend in terms of rethinking compliance tools is if you use the tool Turnitin, um, there's a lot of, in the academic libraries community, um, and probably also in other instructional communities as well, there's a lot of conversation about Turnitin and what is it, does it mean we don't trust students and what, you know, what is it putting an undue burden on students in certain ways? I think we can um, use Turnitin really effectively actually as a teaching tool, as well as a way to identify plagiarism issues. So as an instructor in the past, um, I have taught a couple of different courses that had research papers. I have had academic integrity violations and plagiarism issues in my classes. But one of the things that I have tried to do and that I found really effective is to turn on the turn it in option for a draft, like an ungraded draft or a pass fail draft. We'll talk more about this so that when students um, submit a draft, you can share with them what the actual Turnitin report looks like. What is it catching? And this, for me, this has been actually a very helpful way to teach students about the, their misconceptions about paraphrasing in particular. You just can't change a couple of verbs and word tenses and, you know, bust out your you know, thesaurus and be done with um, paraphrasing. You've got to really truly put things in your own words. The other thing I also, while I'm talking about Turnitin, 
If you're not already doing this, look closely at Turnitin reports because it flags a lot of quotes, which we would usually consider to be ethical uses of information. So uh, I, I know that there are um, some instructors I've worked with who just go by the percentage that, that Turnitin pops up, but that's not always accurate. Again, talking about the, the sort of one shot, and that's a term we use a lot in library instruction when we're talking about a synchronous one time per semester session. But a lot of times any conversations we're having in classrooms, whether it's us as librarians or you as instructors of record are really uh, maybe just quick one and done kind of conversations, you know, plagiarism, bad, don't do it, sign the form, you know, and then it doesn't always, it doesn't really stick because that doesn't actually put the level of like the, the level of emphasis on it that we might need. So um, I always love this saying practice makes progress instead of practice makes perfect. Give students low stakes chances. And we'll talk more, I'll give you some examples of this. Low stakes chances to practice their source integration and citation skills. And those can be like short little writing assignments where you ask them to actually cite a source and that can help you do some course correcting in a really small, low stakes situation rather than waiting until the you know, final report or final paper is due. You can also work with your liaison librarian to develop a session or an asynchronous Canvas module or synchronous online session about ethically using sources. We have lots of resources we can provide that help students practice with source use, with integration, with paraphrasing, to ask questions about citing from someone who's not grading them. Sometimes just having that additional point of contact and having that be someone who is, um, you know, maybe they see as a little bit more neutral because again, we're not giving them a grade on anything. They might feel a little more comfortable asking questions. There's haven't been a lot of studies in the library and information science literature about uh, anti-plagiarism instruction, but there was one pretty small scale study a few years back um, that indicated that most course instructors didn't at this, it was really a single institution to be clear. Um, they didn't bring librarians in for plagiarism discussions and they didn't really think about it. They didn't think about that as an option. The other thing I want to suggest here under sort of, you know, this, this, this whole slide is really about integrating it throughout your course. If you can connect plagiarism in any way to your course concepts, uh, I think that that really helps drive it home. Um, just, you know, this isn't gonna work with every course, but I bet in most fields, you could find some examples of potential plagiarism cases, and we'll talk more about case studies. Um, but if you can connect it to what you're teaching, I think that it just, you know, it gives it more context going back to the contextual idea, but it also is something then that brings students back to thinking about this concept um, more than just right before, you know, they're completing an assignment that requires citations. And then responding to Hill and Tadeo uh, talking about decontextualized uh, anti-plagiarism instruction, Talk to your students about why we cite things, right? We're not just avoiding plagiarism. We're not just trying to avoid a punitive action. We're trying to build our credibility. We're giving credit to the people who deserve it. And we're becoming part of scholarly conversations. I think depending on you know, your field or the students that you work with, you can also frame this as, you know, we're helping to um, center voices that haven't been centered in our fields, right? Bringing in underrepresented voices, citing people who haven't been cited as much, opening up those scholarly conversations so that they're more equitable and just. So those are, depending on sort of what, what your students are into, those can be really helpful conversations. Um, the other thing too, I would say, just again, talk to your students about why you cite. How do you cite things? How do you decide what to use? How do you decide what to cite? And why is that important in your work? The next thing I have on here, and I think this is really, really important, is to provide clear and detailed expectations on your assignment sheets. Um, I would recommend using your assignment sheets to provide, especially when you're teaching online and you kind of have everything in Canvas, I highly recommend putting in links to resources that you think are helpful, resources that either we have from the library about citations, for example, 
or resources that are out there about paraphrasing, about avoiding plagiarism, about you know what direct quoting looks like, as many sort of resources and explanations and expectations as you can provide, I'd say go for it. The other thing, and I'll talk more about this um, in a moment because it's one of my favorite ways to talk about plagiarism and academic integrity is to use case studies. So when we talk about academic integrity, most of the time it is, I mean, you can tell by its name, right? It's sort of an academic academia kind of convention, right? We're talking about how we cite things in an academic world. And many of our students are not going to stay in an academic world, right? Those of us who are here, we, we did, right? I always say like, I went to college, I stayed in college, I went to grad school, I work at college, I never left college basically. So for me, it's always been an academic convention that I understood as being sort of important. But for our students who might want to see how it works in the real world, which is, I have that in those scare quotes there because I don't think that the university is not the real world, but we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, I'll just pause right here before I jump in and give some examples to see if anyone has any questions. There's no questions in the chat. But, um, feel free that y'all can unmute or drop it in the chat as we go, as always. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, I was just curious when you were using the, um, and I know professors use the, uh, the, the plagiarism tool there. Um, write it in. Would that, yeah, write it in. Would that be, would there ever be a time when you maybe would even suggest to a student to use that if they're unsure about their paraphrasing or citation integration or not? Yes, but the thing that makes that a little complicated is that the instructor has to have it turned on in the past is to have just sort of a um, a generic assignment called turn it in, um, where I have let students just submit their papers through that. They tell me that they've done that, and I can give them a PDF copy of uh, what turn it in um, sends out. But they can't access it just like as a tool on their own. That's one of the things that's a little frustrating about turn it in. Um, but you can make it uh, make it available for your students if you're an instructor of record. So, okay, thanks. Sure, yeah. I think there are some plagiarism checker kind of tools out there that students can access directly, but mostly not the ones that like universities pay for because they try to keep those a little more locked down um, in the system. Oh, great. Thanks, Sam. I'm glad I explained it. And then you didn't have to. All right, so I'm gonna jump on or go on here with things that you can try with your classes. Um, but again, please feel free to put questions in the chat and I will have some time for questions towards the end. To me, I think one of the best things that you can do as an instructor is to model ethical use of sources. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to put citations on your slides or other things that you create for your course. Um, I actually don't see this a lot in classes that I work with. And often it's probably because you might be citing things that are in the class reading. And so there might be kind of an expectation that students know where that particular quote or idea is coming from. Um, but when you do clearly cite things from required readings, it helps students see, oh, we're supposed to do that. When I write my final paper, if I cite, if I use stuff from our class readings, I still need to say that that's where I got it from. So to me, this is a really uh, kind of, it might take a little bit of upfront work, especially if you already have a lot of things prepared, but it is over time, a pretty easy way to just show what you're doing. And you can talk about it explicitly. Hey, notice that on my slides, like I did earlier in this presentation, I had a few little parenthetical citations. That's the kind of thing I'm expecting from you as students. The other thing is um, you can do the same thing when you attribute multimedia sources. If you use images or memes or, or videos or anything like that, you can just give an attribution. And again, what that does is help students see that this is something you value. You value the use of information in an ethical way that includes citations or attributions. And you're not just asking them to do it. That's a lot of times the resistance I hear from students is, Oh, why am I being asked to do this really onerous thing when it's just like not even that important? Um, being able to show like, oh no, this is important to me. This is not something I'm just 
not a hoop I'm asking you to jump through because the university requires it. This matters in the, in the environment that we're in. This is kind of a controversial one because most of the time I wouldn't want to do it. Um, but there you can do activities with students asynchronously, synchronously, where you have them actually read the full academic integrity policy and give them some time um, in a class session, in a module to sort of hit the high points and give them the opportunity to ask questions. And one thing I've done before to varying levels of success is this kind of thing I have here at the bottom of going a little bit meta, having students actually practice paraphrasing, summarizing and quoting from the academic integrity policy itself. Um, one of the biggest issues with academic integrity here at UNCG and every other university that I know of is that typically there's no sort of caveat in there that if you uh, did it by accident, if you plagiarized by accident, then you know you kind of get, get a pass. No, really they are very clear that even accidental plagiarism is still a violation. And so making sure that students have actually seen that, talked through it, asked, what does this mean? Because the wording, a lot of it is kind of, um, it's very academic wording. Um, it is a little bit strange. Sometimes there are things in there that when students really dig into it, they will have questions about. Offering low stakes opportunities to improve. Um, I'm doing another webinar tomorrow about information literacy scaffolding. Um, and this is a great way to think about scaffolding information literacy and sort of anti-plagiarism opportunities throughout the semester. So I already sort of alluded to this, um, both of these examples really, but if you do have room for short writing assignments, and I'm talking short like, you know, two paragraphs or something like that, um, requiring source use in a few of those um, can be really helpful so that you can say, oh, you know, I asked you to cite the source, but actually you just provided a link here and that's not how sources work or not how citing sources work in our field. So it gives them a chance to practice in a way that's not gonna harm their grade or not significantly harm their grade. And I have already mentioned this, but offering draft opportunities for larger assignments um, again, gives you that opportunity to say, all right, I see you're having major issues with what paraphrasing is. Um, here are some resources that are available for you, or here's a librarian you can talk to. Here's the writing center that you can talk to. Lots of good resources on campus. And here's where I suggest that, that you might consider using Turnitin for these drafts in a way that students know, okay, I'm not going to get turned in for a violation here. Um, I am practicing, I'm drafting, and I'm going to be able to see what gets flagged. And I have had people, when I suggested this before, ask me if I then worry if students are going to game the system and just change enough. And to me, if they're spending that much time thinking about how to actually sort of change the way that they have written their paper, um, they are paraphrasing now, right? They are learning how to do it effectively. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen that as a problem. And then I think this is my final one here. I love case studies. Um, so I have some examples and I'm going to put a link in the chat here, but it'll also be within um, my slides, which you will get. Um, but I just have a Google doc here where I keep some case study examples. Now, there has been a hot new plagiarism case study that has come up in the last couple of weeks, in the last week maybe, which has to do with one of our librarian favorite websites, Snopes, um, which it turns out that there's a huge BuzzFeed news. Um, and if you're not familiar with BuzzFeed news, it's not the one where they just make the lists or the quizzes. BuzzFeed news is uh, like truly like investigative journalism, like pretty hardcore. If you look at this, like just look at all this, such a, it's a very well-researched article. Um, but um, yeah, so the founder of Snopes, um, wrote, it turned out, I think, to be 60 plagiarized articles for the website. It is, it was heartbreaking to me as a Snopes fan. Um, as I can see Sam on camera, just can we, can we even believe it? Um, and so one of the things that this can do is to talk a little bit with students about things like 
what does this do for Snopes reputation, right? As a website that lots and lots of people have been citing and using for years, what does this mean in an, in an information environment where misinformation is such a problem that we have to have websites like this? Do we, do we not trust them? You know, kind of looking, and then looking also at Snopes, um, I have linked on here, um, their uh, sort of response which is like many other sort of apologies in this kind of scenario, not as, not as, not as good as you'd like it to be. Um, I have several other examples um, from different kinds of settings. Some of them are academic. Um, so for example, William and Mary um, did plagiarize a state athletics cuts back in 2020. Um, there are others here, including some videos. Um, I actually show uh, quite a few, and I'm not going to do this sound here. Um, I show quite a few videos of Beyonce, and then I always tell students, if you know Beyonce, like, please don't tell her that I'm using her as an example of potential plagiarism. Um, but this is a video, again, I've got the sound off, but you can kind of see the, the way that it's set up here is they are comparing this countdown video um, to a uh, some choreography and some sort of other uh, kind of images to show where a lot of this inspiration may have come from. And this can start a conversation about like, where's the line between inspiration and plagiarism or copyright violation. But if you are a Beyonce fan, as I am, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, insult her. Um, but it is really interesting when you start to look at this and, and it can open up a really good conversation because many students too are strong Beyonce fans and they will let you know how they feel about you even bringing her up in this kind of context. So it can get some engagement going. Um, another one that I like to use that has a video is from Fragile Trust, um, which was a PBS uh, documentary series about uh, Jason Blair, who is, was a serial plagiarist for the New York Times. Um, and there are videos of him talking about, ultimately talking about the amount of effort that he put into plagiarizing. That it's something that students are often kind of interested in. They'll be like, but why did he work so hard just to plagiarize if he could have just written the article? And I think that's perfect. Um, so uh, when I use uh, when I use these videos, it's it's interesting too because there's another little clip from here that does talk a bit about how um, how he got caught, um, how he sort of started recycling some of his some of his uh, moves, his plagiarism moves, um, and he was caught. Um, so there are a lot of examples. Um, so Sam just mentioned there's a, a Cole Bear video. Um, which is from when when it was still the um, the Colbert Report. Um, many, I think, it's from 2011 or 2012, um, and it's about that. That's an example of that bad paraphrasing. So I do use that sometimes, um, but I don't know that students would always understand. Not and not just students. That people would always understand why that could be considered a plea, an issue of plagiarism. But it is a good conversation to have. So what happens when we misrepresent? our original source. So that's something that I can add um, on here. Basically, uh, that there's a big, it's a, it's a segment about um, a big statue of Martin Luther King Jr. that has etched on the side. Um, I was a drum major for peace, something in righteousness, I think. Um, and it's a poor, like it doesn't accurately reflect what he actually was saying. So that can open up some more sort of nuanced conversations about uh, is, is it still plagiarism if the words were in there, but I'm putting them together in a way that's probably not reflective of the original intent? All right. Um, I have some resources on here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and put the link to the slides back in here again. You will get this from Sam with the recording, um, but these are some resources that I recommend. The Citation Project is really cool. Um, and I'll just pop over there real quick right now. This is, these are some um, like, uh, rhetorical writing, you know, the um, like college writing, first year writing kind of folks um, who do rhetoric and composition, who have done some pretty extensive research on 
citations and also how students write. And one of the things that they have found, there's a plagiarism section here, is that they give you some examples, some different um, potential sources to look at, most of which are in a book that I also have um, linked on the resources slide. Uh, but these are these talk often about the difference between um, you know, intentional plagiarism and what they call patch writing. And that can be really interesting as well. Um, and again, that patch writing is usually what we see with people who are attempting to paraphrase by, you know, saying beautiful instead of pretty. You know, again, I always tell students you don't you shouldn't need a thesaurus to do your paraphrasing. If it's that good, just quote it. Um, so this is this can be a really useful resource. Um, plagiarism.org is one that I saw come up quite a bit when I was researching this. Um, and they have some good sort of teaching ideas here, including some videos that you can use, um, which I think are pretty cool. Um, and then I mentioned we have a plagiarism research tutorial that you can actually embed in your Canvas course or use separately. And then this is a book we have access to called The Handbook of Academic Integrity. Again, probably doesn't sound like the most interesting read in the world, but it has a lot of interesting um, sections specifically about teaching. Um, how do we teach this? You see, it's very lengthy in terms of the number of things that are included, but it also has a lot of um, applications in different uh, disciplinary settings. And I also have, of course, like I said, trying to model appropriately here. I have my citations at the end. Um, and then that is it. I know I have gone over two minutes. So I just want to thank you all. I am happy to stay here and answer questions if people have any. Um, I will go ahead and just toss my email address um, in the uh, chat here. I think about this stuff a lot and talk about this stuff a lot. So if you have questions about it, um, please feel free to talk to me about it today or another time. So thank you. Oh, and Sam has put a note about the next in the series. Oh, I need to sign up for that. That sounds really good. I haven't signed up for the next ones yet. And yes, I am doing another one tomorrow about scaffolding information literacy. Um, and that is going to be fun because it may refer to some of the things I talked about today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing just to see. Thank you all so much for spending your... Uh, one your post lunch or your lunch hour with me today and i thought that was useful but i guess i'm by yeah. librarian <laughs> no i really appreciated that that was really helpful because i okay. that i'm fairly new to uncg and i'm starting my third year but every course that i've been involved with i have had to develop pretty much from scratch in canvas and so i think about ways to kind of like in the students and so I try to do a meme or I try to do things but I thought about that the other day like I need to kind of probably start putting in where I'm finding this and so I'm gonna um reach out for some examples and yeah, yeah. And Joan um and I work together in community and recreation and uh Jenny Ms. Teaching oh yeah we talked about uh, CTR yes, yeah. yeah um so Jenny is the person who I talked to about how we could integrate um, some of the information literacy citation stuff, mm -hmm. of course, for Amy and Juanita. Well, um, so you can see I'm consistent in my recommendations. You are. You are. a lot of the same right. stuff today. And yeah. Joan, I mean, we can talk about this later, but um, your students are filling out a Google form about um, source of right. Yes. It's mostly, right. it's mostly great. <laughs> okay, good. well, I, I was worried. I'm, I'm, today, this afternoon, I was um, even looking at their memes. They're supposed to kind of identify what is yeah. it. Mean to you in a meme, find me a picture and you know, post it. I need to get them to oh, add I want that, that assignment. Tell me where you found this. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have a few that I'm like, what what is this? <laughs> like, yeah. like, wait a minute. So yeah, we will we will work on it for sure. But um yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. So Amy and Juanita, um, are there any questions before I know it's uh, a little past 1 30. Sorry, I always go over. No. Oh no! So it's, um, yeah, I'm. Right. I'm glad to. You know, maybe I'll meet somebody this evening at the new faculty event that I can wow with my 
newly learned pl <laughs> plagiarism. <laughs> uh, Why not? Anti-plagiarism mm -hmm. knowledge. Uh, yeah, I will say in, in class, like if I do a one shot, you know, like I um, don't usually have time to do like a full thing about plagiarism, right? But like, I usually always say when we're talking about the citation part of the one shot, I'm like, the biggest thing I see is that a lot of plagiarism is unintentional, you know, and it's usually to do around your citations, you know, or paraphrase, you know, these things. I was like, so um, those citations seem boring, you know, like keep that in mind, we don't want there to be plagiarism. And usually students are really kind of blown away by that. They're like, oh, like I could get plagiarism accidentally, you know, like I think they just think of it as, as like this malicious thing that they wouldn't do. And you're like, no, I mean, it can, it can be, un it can be accidental. You can, you can plagiarize accidentally. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I would say it usually is. At UNCP. Usually is. I mean, majority um, of the time. Yeah. hundred percent. There I will. I mean, I have had students a couple of times be like, no, I just ran out of time and I copied and pasted this. Yeah. Like, that does happen. I put, I, you know, it's, it's usually more like, oh, I had in-text citations, but I didn't put any citations at the end. Yes. Like they're yeah, just in some of the conventions. I can believe that because at undergrad, I had a class that was so much project-based mm -hmm. that I had a professor flag one of my citations and I was like, oh my God, because I had not done citating like in two years. Everything was group project, group project, group project. So, you know, of course, we cited a lot of the stuff that we used, but it was so not traditional academic work that I had, like, forgotten and unintentionally stole someone's work. <laughs> Just, I don't think so, I, mean, I ever, happens. I mean, yeah, I know that I never in my undergrad had a librarian come to my class. I never took a library tutorial. I had it once any of my teachers even mentioned plagiarism. I mean, if there were something like turn it in, I didn't know about it, you know? Um, I mean, I do remember like probably overusing block quotes, but I don't even think I was like dinged that much, you know? <laughs> like, I, I think they were just like, don't overuse these block quotes. Yeah, we were like, we'd love to hear from you in this paper. Yeah, like, so, like, you know, but I, they didn't ding. I mean, to me, I was the kind of undergrad that if they didn't ding me, I'd be like, well, I'm gonna keep doing it. You know? I guess it's fine, yeah. This is fine. So anyway, this is really interesting. I think we've come a long way. I mean, I didn't know about those plagiarism sources, um, you know, uh, resources that you recommend. Those look really great. I'm going to look into those. And I really love the examples. Um, I'm going to be looking at those for my class. Yay, great. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for doing this. Recording. Please let us know if you anything else. Um, everyone have a great first week. Of yes. You too. Enjoy it. Wherever you are. Bye, y'all. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much.